changed through the year 2000. Well, you saw Roger Penske there. It's a significant skirmish because it places Tony George and Roger in an adversarial position. And really, what the bottom line of it is, it just puts the Mercedes business to bed. It's done, it's finished. They can't have enough horsepower with that kind of boost, so they'll just have to use something else. All right, more on current situations. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Further pursuing that business of the black flag, Paul, for Paul Tracy, we talked with Clive Howell, who's on the radio with Tracy. We had heard from Richard Buck in Al Unser's camp. Clive simply said, yes, Paul questioned the call, and he was not happy on the radio. But he says, you can't question a black flag. You cannot take a chance. We had to bring him in. And he says, we've done it. We've got him back out. Now as we get set to go green, we've got a brand new race. We're back to racing. Green flag and Paul Tracy is very much a man with a purpose. He's got two cars, Robbie Gordon and Stefan Johansson between him and the leader of the race, Al Unser Jr. Back on board with Gordon. Gordon runs in fourth place. The Penske cars are first, second, and third. Unser Jr., Tracy, and Fittipaldi. Now the red and the blue car, Stefan Johansson, that car, for example, doesn't have springs on it. Another change I might mention. Right there, right in the center of the street, red and blue car. That car uses air shocks only. Air and liquid, of course, for the hydraulic part to make the shock absorber. The car rides on air. Something that was done many years ago. It's coming back in. Do you think it's a coming thing, uh, Bobby? Yes, I do. I don't see any reason. I drove one made back in the early 60s, Sam. It was good. Now we have new technology and better stuff to work with. Paul Tracy, of course, again finds himself having to find a way past Robbie Gordon. This time, a different scenario because he is no longer leading the race. Look at that, of an amazing bid. There's a deal where Robbie got in there a little bit too fast, couldn't get the car down. Paul just went right up underneath him, left him no way to get back down. Yeah, but look at Teo Fabi here. We said that Tracy would be a man with a purpose, but Fabi is very much in this fight as well as he tries to get around. Robbie Gordon. By the way, the 16 car, Stefan Johansson, you were talking about him, Bobby. Ken Anderson, the engineer on that car, does a rem remarkable job with all of those shock absorbers. He started well back in the field in 21st position and now runs in 12th. So something must be working for Johansson. Well, they've said that they know that it's better. The team doesn't have an awful lot of money, so testing has been a premium. But they definitely say that the air shocks are better than putting the steel spring steel springs like we have on passenger cars on the car. Don't overlook the skill of Stefan Johansson. Watch him drive that blue and red car there. It's just terrific. Another refugee from Formula One who's really taken to Indy cars and do, does a beautiful job. And look how much of the race course he uses. He has a line that takes up every inch of this 2.2 mile mid-Ohio sports car course. And of course the idea of the air shocks is to keep the tires on the ground more often, less wheel spin, or where it's rough. Now this track is not real rough, so I don't think they shine as good here on the air shock as they would at some track we run at. But it makes common sense that where it gets rough, they're going to have an advantage. But Bobby trying to keep the wheel on the ground as much as they can, and yet having the suspension be able to adjust to a rough part of the course and then a smooth part of the course is what the Penske's have been so good at and now the Lola's seem to be catching up as well as the Renard. That's really where all the focus of development is right now. Yes, and of course remember another thing, above all, there's a lot of different ways to build a mousetrap and that's really what all these guys do. A lot of different ideas and they just take a different direction to get to the same place. All right, right now the distance from the leader back to Paul Tracy is 3.8 seconds. This is a vital thing. He has got to get by Johansson and set sail for Little Al if this is going to be close. The There's Indy Little Al. Now look up at the top of the screen. Here comes the red and blue car of Johansson, and there is Paul Tracy. He's got to dispose of Hansen, Johansson right now. 3.8 seconds behind at the last crossing of the line. Little Al, of course, again. can look in his mirrors, and as long as he sees Stefan Johansson and not Paul Tracy, his heart is light. He can't see him back that far, Sam. The idea is Little Al wants to make hay while the sun shines, so to speak. He's going to get away as far as he can, so when Paul does get around Johansson, he's not going to have to worry about him for a while. Moving to the final laps of this race, okay, 12 to go. There's Johansson motioning Paul Tracy by, so we're going to have a clean pass. He Here told we go. him to go by on the inside, breaking down at the end of the long straightaway. Made it very easy for him. 
So oh, now, yeah. Paul Tracy, in definite contact with Al Unser Jr. Look at Robbie Gordon. Thank you, Hansen, for moving to the side and letting him come through as well. Boy, Gordon is, is in fourth place. He's not in direct pursuit contact with Paul Tracy. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Boy, is it great when you get a wave by like that from an adversary. Yeah, but you, look at Johansson as he uses all the course again. You know what drives you nuts, though, is when you get a wave by like that. And the driver is lifting his hand off the wheel in a very difficult part of the circuit, like he did there. Yeah, well, Hansen like, being hard to pass like that just gave little Al up to six seconds. In other words, from 3.8 to six seconds, or roughly a two-second gap on Paul Tracy, which you can see right here. Paul Tracy's way down there. Now, little Al wants that much, or maybe even more, because this guy is really capable of winning. But you can see there that Paul Tracy, in the past couple laps, has not really been turned on quite as much as Al Unser Jr. Maybe now that he's open in traffic, he will be able to close, but the reality on the stopwatch is the past three laps, he's actually fallen a bit behind. So Al Unser Jr. turned the lap just now at 117 miles an hour. He's averaging 109. We'll be back after this message and a word from your ABC station. Monroe Sensatrack. Road sensing shocks and struts. Designed to give you... On board with Raul... On board with Raul Boisel at the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course, the Miller Genuine Draft 200. We look at the telemetry. He just went around Eddie Cheever, who is driving A.J. Foyt's number 14 car. Eddie is in that car, of course, because Brian Herta was injured in a practice accident at Toronto's Exhibition Place on the 16th of July. The good news is that Brian Herta is doing very, very well. He's on crutches now. As a matter of fact, he went to the Brickyard 400 that you saw here on ABC last week, and he expects to be back racing at the beginning of next season. I know everybody in the pits wishes Brian Herta well. You know, Nick Steinman has never won a race. Right here with Boisel. He's come so close this year and had some bad luck with it. Good car, good team. They really are getting up in the first class deal. They need a win. Boisel has moved from uh, a starting position back in the teens up to eighth. He's had one of the best drives today. He started 17th. He's a smooth driver. Of course, he almost won the Michigan 500 two weeks ago. The interesting thing about him, Stan, is he's good on any type of track, whether it's a road circuit or an oval. Currently running in third place is the third Penske car, Emerson Fittipaldi. There he is. Penske cars once again, one, two, and three. This is going to continue that battle for the championship between Unser Jr. and Fittipaldi, and Michael Andretti sits in fifth, so the points are going to maintain the same relative interview. Next Actually, week, they're going to slide out just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Next week, they head off to Loudoun. Very, very fast oval. You'll see coverage of that as well as the rest of the season on ESPN. Not One other note, and don't forget this, the IROC comes up next. And the IROC is one terrific race to determine the championship. Don't miss that one. Looking at Emerson Fittipaldi right there. A lot of people ask me, Paul, is Emma going to retire next year? Everybody kind of assumes he's getting old and tired, but I'm going to tell you something. This guy is not old. He's not tired. I don't think he's going to retire anytime soon, and I think he's as tough now as he's ever been. Seven laps to go. Emerson Fittipaldi, who won the last two races here at Mid-Ohio, and holds the race record at 107.352 miles an hour. They're faster than that now at 109.9. Ari Leyendijk, he's done a nice job coming up through this field. If you're Roger Penske and you've got Al Unser Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, and Paul Tracy driving for you, you say, whoa, if I want to cut my team to two cars instead of this fairly unwieldy three cars, who do I cut? Be a hard decision to make, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the one that would ever have to make that decision. Best indication, though, is if they would reduce to a three-car team, Sam, is that from some people very close to Paul Tracy that he might be the one to go. Well, that's where does we he go? Hear. That's what we hear. But when you think of letting that kind of talent get away from you. Dominic Dobson, of course, again. Not well, having not, the most does, pleasant of days. Doesn't have, get a lot of traction on that grass with those slick tires. You notice that? This is one of the Pac West team cars, Scott Sharp being in the other one, and Danny Sullivan tested for this team 
earlier this week. We talk, of course, about who might drive for who next year. Sullivan went very, very well for this team, helped them with their setups and so forth, and Danny Sullivan is looking for a ride. Might he wind up in a car like this? Who knows? You know, it was interesting that all the talk, what we call the silly season, on who's going to end up where next year was very hot the past couple of weeks, and then suddenly it's gotten very quiet again. Let's go down to the Penske pit once again, Gary. Well, those who follow the racing fortunes of these teams on scanners have been getting an earful from Roger Penske talking with Junior a lot as they try to protect the lead, advising him to watch it, watch it, go carefully, watch the downshifting. Now with five laps to go, we understand he was just given the message, he being unsir, it's your own race, go for it. So now the, they've just uh, pulled out all the stops and... Uh, He's looking awful strong, isn't he? Paul Tracy very definitely not in pursuit. Seven and a half seconds behind. Yeah, little Al's also smart enough to know that he's not going to try to make nine seconds out of a seven point something seconds gap. He doesn't need it. He just wants to win. Ironically, he's really after the points battle more than I've ever seen him in my life. Let's go back. Nigel Mansell runs in seventh place. Raul Boisel is closing on Mansell. Battle of the Lola's here. Mansell who qualified almost a full second quicker than any other Lola in the field. Now we've talked about Dick Simon who owns the Bosell car and how he doesn't have the support perhaps financially or otherwise that Mansell has with the factory Lola and the factory help from Ford. What satisfaction it would be for Simon and his team if they could pass Mansell right now in the uh, waning stages of this there's, race. There's probably two and a half times the difference in the budget between the car in front, Nigel Mansell's, and Boyd Sales with the Dick Simon team right there. They operate probably with about, I would say, maximum three, three and a half million, maybe four million a year in Boyd Sales' car, the little gold-colored car there. Mansell, on the other hand, you could either double or triple it, and you'd probably still be way under it, Sam. Not mentioning paying Nigel's salary. Well, Nigel's salary, for example, would be more than than Boy Sells or Nick Simon's budget for the entire year. That's the ironic difference between these things. For an update on Nigel Mansell, here's Jack. Well, it's not been a great day for Nigel Mansell. From the start of the race, he complained about the handling of the car. He's been battling a severe understeer throughout the course of the afternoon. Just a couple of laps ago, he radioed in. He said he felt like the car felt 10 pounds heavier than he'd ever driven before. Don't know if maybe uh, Sam, maybe when he was out there racing with his kids, did he have a little extra ice cream? Oh, well, he had one of the kids with him. Maybe, uh, maybe she's riding with him again now. Three laps to go now for the leader of the race, Al Unser Jr., the Penske cars, Jr., Tracy Fittipaldi, the only ones on the lead lap. You can just watch Mansell. When he gets to those real sharp turns like that, he just almost comes to a stop. And that's, of course, how Boyce Hell stays up on him so close. The car's a good...